Weekly Row Show. Glad you could join us today. Today we have on the line Eric and my friend Emma. Welcome, Eric and Emma. Thanks. Hello, glad to be here. Emma, thanks so much for coming on. Um, would you like to introduce the topic, or can you introduce the topic that you chose today? Yes. I chose coming of age in the last days. So this is talking about the transition from youth to being a young adult. That technically includes all of us since 1830, since that's pretty much when the last day started. But I was talking more about the unique challenges of today. That's great. Well, the unique challenges of today, um, as in like this year, the two, the late, mid to late 2000s, as we go into the 2000s, um, like, the, and going, so if I understand you correctly, you want to talk about what we're dealing with now, what I might foresee going into the tribulations as we prepare for the second coming and build as we go into the millennium. Is that kind of what you want to do? You got it. Or translation okay. <laughs> questions that Emma has and is trying to disguise for a larger audience. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> translation. You want to talk about translation? <laughs> Some people want to talk about translation. We should do a podcast on translation, Eric. It would be a that fantastic actually, topic. That actually yeah. is one of mine. That I is one of yours? I don't want to jump into that right now. Yeah, we but, can't do that today. That's a whole podcast, but you would be interested in that, huh, Emma? Yeah, I would. I'd tune in. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people interested in that topic. That is an amazing topic that we need to to put on the shelf for now, but maybe as we get some other podcasts going, we can do some more of that later. Um, If that's not a teaser for the crowd, I don't know what is, right? Let them know. There's other other podcasts coming. (laughs) (laughs) Some people are like, translation? She's crazy. What does that mean? Translation? And other people are like, really? Records coming for us? Yes, folks, we're talking about all of it. And <laughs> translation of the body, the mind, the spirit, and the earth. So we could talk about record translations. We could talk about translation of the body. But anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. Let's <laughs> get back to Emma and her yeah, awesome topic. Coming back to this, Eric yeah. pointed out, I had mentioned this topic to him. He said, aren't these things you could just ask your parents? Which is <laughs> true. But I wanted to view them through the lens of your message because I oh, think that this cool. would help other people receive answers that they're looking for. I'm, I've that's been cool. to a few of your speaking events, and I always feel like one of the youngest ones there, and right. I'm in my early 20s, and I would, there's just other situations that people have faced that I haven't experienced yet. Mm-hmm. So, yes, these are questions coming back to me. I guess I am part of the me generation. I think this is great. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I love you so much, because we have such good conversations. It's fun to have you on the podcast. Um, Emma is a very good friend of mine. In fact, um, her dad, Chad Dabel, is my publisher. Emma is well-known in her own right for the work she's done. Um, in part, she is the voice on my audiobooks, and she has gone through quite a bit in doing those audiobooks. And I just want to publicly thank you, Emma, for the work on those books. You did a marvelous job. I know you faced a great deal of... Um, opposition in a very real way, um, in a very physical way with um, adversarial attacks and other things to be able to produce those audiobooks. And I, I am absolutely amazed at your strength, and I'm so thankful for you. So thanks for doing those books. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. And I love you very much. So um, I'm going to start crying if I keep talking about that because I think you're so amazing. Emma has a lot of her own gifts that are very um, amazing. and I. I think it's really telling Emma who you are. Um, given that Chad Dable is your dad and your mom is so wonderful like she is, you really could go to them and ask questions. I know that you do. Um, but it's always good to get second um, witnesses, two or three witnesses. The Lord always works in patterns. He works in patterns of two, three, seven, twelve, fifteen, twenty-four, thirty-two, seventy-two. 12, 15, 24, 32, 72. It expands out. And one of the patterns that he has is through the law of witnesses. So your dad is a witness to you, your mom's a witness to you, and then I'm a witness to you, and anyone else who comes in your path. I think it's important that people pay attention to that pattern because all truth circumscribed in an eternal whole, you will find at least two witnesses 
to that truth at some point on your journey. And that's one of the many ways people can tell that this is a true story, a true message, is that they will come across another witness. My witness is not the only one. And then individually getting a witness for themselves through the Holy Spirit. So I'm glad that you decided to choose this topic because there are a lot of people and a lot of youth. And what I look at is anywhere from age 10, 11, 12 on into like their, you know, late 20s really that I'm talking about when we're talking about this generation of youth going in that will help prepare the way for New Jerusalem and the second coming of Christ. This really is a unique generation. You could break that into two generations if you wanted, but I look at it as one generation because we have some very mature 12-year-olds on the planet, and we have some really um, um, amazing men and women in their 20s, and many of those teenagers and young adults will be working side-by-side side with those in their 20s. And and um, I see such great things, everything from temples being built, to um, to translation, like we mentioned, and a lot of transition from the old world, if you will, to the new world, where we're looking at going through the tribulations and then transitioning as our bodies heal or transition and go into the millennium. And I think that is fascinating. I think it's the coolest thing ever that we have these these um, kids that are on the planet now and young adults are on the planet now who premortally were foreordained to come to the earth at this time for this special mission. And I think it's just amazing. It's terrific. So what do you have for me, Emma? What's your first question? All right. My first question, it has to do with when people make big life changes, like getting married, going on missions, moving away to college. When you Mm -hmm. make big decisions like that, there's the potential that with the disasters that are coming, you might not ever see your family again. How right. do you cope with impending changes like that? Right. That's a good question. That is a fear of a lot of people, both of parents, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, grandparents, and of the youth themselves, especially as they transition, like we said, from, you know, once they graduate from high school, going into their college years, and those transition years. Because especially in your early 20s, where you are right now, it's a major time of transition, Right. Um, even if we didn't have the tribulations coming, it's a change. In a lot of cases, for instance, in the LDS church, if a son's going to go on a mission, he goes, he leaves for two years, and then comes home, um, with the exception of a few unforeseen circumstances where there might be an accident or something on somebody's mission. And I'm I'm right there with you or with your parents because my oldest just graduated from high school. He's putting his mission papers in in the next couple of weeks, and He's 18 years old. I foresee that he will, at some point in time, be involved in the Lord's Army with the elders of Israel, training to defend for the Constitution. Same with my son, who is 16, that'll be 17 in December. And it tugs on my heartstrings very deeply. It always has. There's That is the quickest way to get me to cry when I think about the tribulations, is to think about what's going to happen to my husband and my boys when they go to defend and practice um, practice to defend this constitution in the, the land of America. And and then we, we take into account any time we're in war, right? Because there's, that's going to affect our young men, which will also in turn affect our young women. And, and that can be scary, right? It's kind of scary not to know where you're going, what you're doing, if you're going to come home, who you're going to see, who you may or may not see again. And so there's a lot of fear energy involved for people when they hear this message and they have children in those age brackets because there are a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of unknown. Don't you think on that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question, Emma. What is one of your coping strategies that you've learned to be able to handle the knowledge you've been given, having grown up with a dad who's visionary, who's had two NDEs, and who has explained these things to you and written books and things about it. You've been pretty well prepared, but even after going through and knowing what you know, what is one of your coping strategies that you employ to be able to handle um, what's coming? Oh, I wasn't expecting a question back at me. <laughs> you want me to give it a little time? Well, that's how much I think of you. You are an amazing woman, and you, you have incredible gifts, and I really trust 
that you can speak to the audience about that. If you want, we can give you a little bit of time. Yeah, um, definitely. Okay. I guess that's one of the ways the Savior would teach is by asking questions in return. But to give listeners a bit of context, my dad wrote a book series about what would happen with some of the events around the Second Coming, and that was published when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And after reading that, it wasn't his intent, but I was convinced I wasn't going to go to college or things like that, that the world would fall apart before that time. And Uh I'm about to graduate from college next month, so things turned out a little differently than I would have expected, which I'm happy about, (laughs) for the record, right now. But throughout my teenage years and into starting college, there was always that thought of, well, things like I might start college, but what if I don't finish this semester because of things happening? Mm -hmm. And for the record, my dad never put that fear in me. This was fear coming from another source. And what helped me, I guess, was to go forward with faith and just go as if things weren't going to change. In your book, you mentioned the phrase, keep planting your cherry trees. Mm -hmm. I think that's why it counts. That really helps me. And so I'm continuing to plant my cherry trees. I I have to admit there's still that fear there that Mm -hmm. just because I I like to plan for the future. But that's something that helps me, I guess, a little bit. Mm That's excellent. That is that is probably the best advice you could give anybody, um, especially as we go through our transition years. We're always changing, right? I think there's an illusion that, like, once you get married or once you finish college or once you get your first job, once you have your first baby, once you start your family, you buy a house, there's always something that people look to in the future, like, well, once I achieve this, then everything's going to kind of be status quo and I'm going to be calm and everything will be fine. And the reality is, is life has changed. Everything's transitioned. So once you're 30, there's going to be something else that will cause um, cause you to need to extend your faith even further. Once, So once you finish college, then you have to get a job. Then you get a job, then you're going to get married, then you're going to have a family, then, then your kids are going to have things that they're dealing with. And so that life has changed. And one of the things I learned growing up as a kid in the military was, um, you can look forward to the next place or the next milestone, but it's important to live in the present day and to enjoy the present day. That's something I have always had trouble with. And I think one of the reasons I did when I was younger is because I had these visions from the time I came to this planet and I saw things, but I didn't have a context for the time frame. I just knew they were going to come. So I was always kind of anticipating that that was going to happen. But You know, I saw things in second grade with Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens that have yet to come to pass, but I was in Washington having visions about them, and I'm 44 now. And if I had spent my whole life waiting for Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier to go off, now Mount St. Helens did, but it's going to go again, and if I had waited for Mount Rainier, well, then I would have wasted a lot of time and a lot of missed opportunities, and I see that like anything else. Um, it's very important that we we look to past, present, and future for learning and growth and what we can take and extrapolate for those lessons, but learn to live in the present day and enjoy life and get joy out of the present, and that takes the fear energy out of it. The adversary, as you guys both know, Eric and, and Emma, never gives up. He doesn't sleep. He never rests. And he will constantly torment, torment us with fear that if we don't do something the right way or, or a certain time or we don't, that we're going to miss the boat or that we screwed up. Or if we don't do something, you know, in a certain way, he's right there to remind us that, you know, we did something wrong or that we, you know, it's too late for us or, you know, some of those messages. Another, another one he does, is putting that fear energy in there. And you can recognize right away that it's not of the Lord and that it's coming from the adversary when you realize you hear a message of truth and immediately after that, you will hear or have a thought or impression or a feeling come over you that is of a lower vibration. And it's like, the best way I can put it is fear energy. And it's not the message that I'm saying. It's the voices around you that are putting those thoughts in your mind 
to make you feel insecure and unsettled. Mm-hmm. And in, in, in order to get away from that or above that or to um, keep it from negatively impacting you, you have to be proactive. And one of the ways you're proactive is by learning more so you know how to release that fear energy and move to the next stage of your progression. And that's, that's what we do when we're in our teenage years and in our college years, right? We're, we're rapidly moving into progression in academics, in our spiritual lives, in our, our personal lives, in our relationships. There's so much change that we go through during those years. My dad, several times when I was in college, said how important those college years were because they were the crossroads. And I thought that was interesting terminology that he used. Um, what do you what do you think about that? And if you have another question that would fall in line with that? Yes, actually. Debt. In your books, you've mentioned seeing debtor's prison. In those right. cases, debt no longer becomes a figurative prison. Our credit cards, car loans, mortgages, medical bills, student loans become a literal prison. And we know what general authorities have spoken on this, but at the same time, the temptations are like, what if I just get a, a loan for two years, but I don't want to find myself? Any thoughts on this? Well, I can tell you what the Spirit told me because I've, I've been in debt with my husband with law school loans for um, like 20 years. We've had law school loans starting since 1997, and we've been paying on them. But we still have we still have law school loans of debt. There are different types of debt: student loans and houses and cars. Those are different. When we have um, and and they will still be able to track you with those, but they will go to the the easiest pickings first. And there are so many factors involved with how they're going to track people, how they're going to utilize records to be able to persuade or coerce or to capture people that have debt or any other tracking device or anything that could tie them down or bind them to the earth or to the government or to to any other institution. And so, again, not being afraid but being prayerful about what you do with your finances. And if the Spirit says, buy a house, buy a house. I bought a house in August. And we didn't have the money to pay for the house. We have a loan on the house. And just yesterday, I asked the Lord about that again because it weighs heavily on my heart when I see what needs to happen with this property. And same with our student loans. And I have a a small credit card debt right now that I've accrued because of my travels for GPRS. And I was told that I need to very quickly, as quickly as I can, pay off the GPRS credit card but that the way would be made known and that the way would be made possible either to pay off my house and or the student loans that we have or it would be inconsequential or would not matter for my individual plan. And I have not been told that I'm going to be able to pay that off and I haven't been told that I won't be able to pay that off. I am being told to have faith, continue paying my bills, to continue trying to get out of debt, to be frugal and to balance that energy with being productive and getting water storage and food storage and hygiene kits and other supplies, not going into debt for those things, but recognizing that in the society we live in, that's that's what's been created in our institutions is bondage and recognizing that source for what it is and knowing, knowing that it's up to us to balance that energy and making sure that we're not being irresponsible and and just going out shopping and, and, you know, taking a bunch of trips and things like that because um, there's a lot more to that question that's deeper than just what meets the eye. And on the personal integrity level, the Lord evaluates our hearts and, and how and what and when we do things like going to debt is balanced in, is, is balanced in the eternities. The other thing is that um, that when it comes to things like tracking, we know that they're going to implant ships. They already do it with animals. They've done it with some people um, in other countries. They're using tracking devices. They're already tracking us in our expenditures everywhere we go. And so we don't want to be paranoid, but we want to be aware that everything you put on Facebook, every put on Google, everything you put online, everything you have in your phone, you need to be aware that people 
are capturing that data and they're doing it for what seems to be a convenient purpose for marketing for companies and things like that. But there is a darker purpose, which is to lay into the GATI instance plan to be able to capture information and track individuals wherever they go. And I think your dad did a really good job in, in a couple of his books where he talked about some of that. Um, and, and when it comes to the debt question, if you have student loans and that was the only way to get your education, then the Lord takes that into account. And if you are supposed to be protected from somebody that would cause you harm, the Lord's going to protect you, and you have to trust in that as well. Does that answer it? That was a long. Yes. <laughs> that was long. So, sometimes I, as I process this, to get a principal statement from that would be have faith, and the Lord will guide you to know what's an essential debt. Well, not an essential debt. Exactly. Debt, but one, well, there one is sometimes be essential debt in the world we live in, I think, with, with the way our systems are set up. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think ultimately, whether it's the debt question or where we're going to go or should we move somewhere or should we take a job or should we go to grad school across the country or across the ocean or, or you know, we, we ultimately pray to the Lord and we get an answer and then we have the courage to do whatever that answer is. And we push our fear aside because we trust the Lord and we know we know his plan for us is the best plan to help us be who he knows we need to be now and going into the eternities. And I'm putting that into practice right now as my son is getting ready to go on his mission. I have never been shown anything about my son's mission. I've shown a lot of before stuff, and I'm being shown after. I have not been shown where he's getting his mission call. I've not been shown that he's serving a mission, although his patriarchal blessing talks about it. And I have, I have not been given that. I continue to ask, and they are not telling me that. And I have to trust that that's for a higher purpose that I don't know that information. <laughs> Maybe this is too lighthearted to say, but I'm thinking now you know how the rest of us feel, Julie. <laughs> Not knowing where you the would. rest of all will be. We do need to lighten it up. I'm getting too intense here. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Now you know how the rest of us feel. Well, that's the other thing. People think I know all this stuff, and I'm like, I guess I do know quite a bit if you go to heaven half a dozen times or whatever, however many. But and I have ongoing dreams and visions, and but that comes with work, right? I mean, I actively work at it, but but there are so many things I don't know, you know. Um, and I I'm a planner by nature. I like to have a list. I like to have my calendar organized. I like to know what I'm doing the next day, and I have it all. But what I'm learning is it's good to be organized and then balance it out with just following the spirit. So I get my plan all together, and I think I have what's going to be for my week. And then I will get going on that plan and the spirit will say, no, don't do that. You need to do this. And I just do the best I can to listen to what is I'm supposed to do, you know? And so I'm, I'm with the rest of you guys, right? I'm trying to figure it out right along with the rest of you, which is why I get things wrong sometimes when I say things on these podcasts or when I put something on my blog or, um, things that I say and the verbiage I use that can be misconstrued, it's because I'm learning right along with everybody else and I don't know when a lot of these things are going to happen. They show me things. They do give me dates sometimes, but they don't give me every date and they don't tell me line by line what's going to happen. It requires an extreme amount of faith on my part as well. And so, anyway. So, well, I didn't I you the opportunity to demonstrate faith just because you've had vision. Right. In fact, in order to have visions, it takes faith. Visions are an act of faith. And I think people forget that. A lot of people think you, you're just blessed with the spiritual gift of having a vision. And, in fact, in order to have that vision, it requires an extreme amount of faith to have a vision to, to begin with. Mm. It doesn't just come. So, at least not for me. I have to actively work at that. Um, the visions come to me. But that's because I've been at this for a long time, and it's a gift I was born with. But I actively have to work at understanding what they are, at seeing clearly, at hearing clearly, because I don't just have a vision. I have communication from the other side that comes in all the sensory motor areas, and that takes work. It's, it's a skill, and it's something that you learn, 
as something that you practice, as something you actively are engaged in. And it starts like a mustard seed, like we learn in the scriptures, like anything else where we build our faith and have our testimony. And I am a firm believer that anyone can have them and that everybody who is on this planet has been endowed with those spiritual gifts. It just isn't activated in their life at that particular time if if they're not experienced. So, does the ability to have visions come and go depending on what the Lord's plan for you is that time? I believe for you is? Yes, I believe that it can. And it also is affected by the degree of righteousness and, and how in line you are with the Spirit. The adversary can give false visions. The Lord can give true visions, obviously. And he can and will withhold them if you are not keeping yourself and you're not keeping your customs not in line with the Spirit to be able to understand and discern those correctly, because it would not be of help if someone is essentially engaging in activity that is um, under their condemnation. It's not helpful for him to show them things if they're not going to act on it. Oh, okay. Thank you, Julie, for answering my questions. Mm -hmm. I have a few more. Are you ready? All right. Let's try another one. I had another question going back to you mentioning your son. Uh I want to know more about young men going to war. I have three brothers and Uh I'm I at some point in the future will have a husband Uh but I'm concerned about them going to war. What's the likelihood of that and what should they do to prepare? Right. The likelihood of young men between the ages right now of anywhere from 14 or 15 years old um, to probably more like 15 to 16, but to, to give us um, a broader range because there will be some on the younger side that will will do some local defense and stuff like that. The likelihood of that between either 14 to 15 years old and men clear into their um, late 40s and early 50s being actively engaged in war in battle is highly likely. Now, particular individuals and your brothers in particular, um, with where you guys are located, I see them doing some local transports, helping with rescue missions. I see them training, um, one of your brothers training in aviation and, um, you know, one of your other brothers working in another capacity there locally with some leadership responsibilities. And your younger brother, I, I see him helping on the local front. Um, now, whether or not they actually go to war and leave your your location where your family lives, I have not been shown that. But because I'm good friends with your family and I'm out in that area a lot and the work I'm involved in is including your family later on, I have been shown scenes of my life with your, with your brothers. And that is why I know some of that information because it interacts with what's going on in my life and some of the things I've seen. So... Or like your younger brother, I see that he helps with those rescue missions on a local level, getting people, um, for instance, we take TRS from one location to like a location four or five miles up the road. And so there are lots of rescue missions, for instance, that will be done on a local and regional and international level. And there's a huge variety as to what both men and women will be involved in. Men in particular learning defensive strategies. I see more defensive strategies than I do offensive strategies with most of the men. But we do, we do have men as elders of Israel who, like the sibling warriors, will be called upon to actually go to war to defend the lands and the people and, and our freedoms. And, um, and so there's a, a wide variety there. I see in most cases men right now in their 20s and 30s, a few of them in their mid to late 40s, as the elders of Israel who will go from um, certain locations that I'm not going to disclose due to the the serious nature of what we're talking about here, going from certain locations, rising up, training together, and then rising up against the enemy forces to combat those forces that would seek to overthrow the United States. Um, and then we've got the older generation that will that will be assisting in the war, but they just don't have the physical capacity to be able to be boots on the ground. And same with the younger. I, I see 
young girls, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, helping to care for orphans and children, helping to assist with food, helping to assist with um, hygiene and other things like that. And in many cases, young teenage children and young adults, both men and women, helping in the healing arts and being able to help people move along when they get the plague and other things. So um, a very powerful, powerful generation that's coming up that will all be for their good and for the, the good of the world as they prepare the way for the second coming and they learn to go through the refiner's fire. Got another so question? So it's not just the young <laughs> men that need to prepare, no. it's everyone. Well, boots on the ground with the elders of Israel is just men, but young women and young adult women need, need everything from nursing skills to alternative health care to birthing to... Um, education, schooling, I see a lot of, a lot of orphans that are going to need the, the women and in some cases the men to come in and help on education. Yep. Julie, can I chime in and Emma and ask a question Mm -hmm. on that note? I'm, everybody on the phone here is interested in education and I, when I think of these young people that Emma's talking about, this coming generation, I think about their education opportunities and their dreams and hopes and what their plans are for the future. Some want to be doctors mm-hmm. and attorneys and, and engineers and whatever. What about, what would it look like to have like an 18 year old or 17 year old right now going, thinking about college, say engineering and, and then the tribulations come and kind of disrupts all that. What do you all see right. for them? I love that question because again, my son is right there. He's going to serve a two year mission or he will be called on a two year mission. And then he wants to go, to BYU for school. What I see is disruption at, at some of those universities. There will still be universities all over the all over the planet. People will still be able to get their education for a time in the United States. We'll have an EMP and some other things going on. We'll be at war and things will be too chaotic to actually have the majority of those institutions in full working capacity. But you look at what happened in World War One, and World War Two, and look at that pattern. Not everything shut down. In the United States, it will be so so chaotic for a while that it will be almost like complete shutdown. But those institutions will come back and they will be better. We will have we will go from Babylonian institutions to having higher orders and higher education. We will have um, not just in New Jerusalem and and um, in those places of safety, but we will have beautiful institutions, beautiful campuses. And, and they will make the current campuses in the United States look look like nothing you you could imagine. I mean, they're, they're going to make our current institutions look like, um, the best way I can describe it, the, the vibration energy from what we're going and transitioning is so dark compared to what we're going to get. So if someone starts an engineering program or a doctorate or nursing or any any kind of profession, my my recommendation is go full force and plan as if you're going to complete that program at that institution, knowing that if it gets interrupted, you'll roll with the roll with the punches, you'll go with the flow, and then you'll pick up that education again, either at that institution or another one, wherever you're supposed to be, and know that it's just going to be better than it was before. And so you don't have to be stagnant. You don't have to worry that you're not going to com- complete it. And any education you get now is to your advantage because knowledge is power and it will be of service to you and those who utilize your skills and your knowledge base. And so you don't want to stop your education. You want to keep being educated. We were educated pre-mortally. We attended universities pre-mortally. We're going to attend them again after the tribulations and during tribulations. And, and, and that a lot of people, because they'll be in the camp situations or they'll be in places of refuge, we will be called upon and asked do education on a more local level in homes and other things for a while, especially for the young children. And some of those those college kids that are being educated now, maybe they're not going to be able to go utilize their teaching degree for money for a job, but they're going to be needing to use those teaching skills in someone's home to teach 15 orphans. And their needs will be met and there will be a higher, higher purpose. And so there are so many reasons why we need to be educated. And the Lord the Lord wants us to be educated in every way that we can, but I believe that we're going to replace the Babylonian institutions with higher places of learning that are far greater. 
So while we're on that note, can do you see anything specific about like methods or modes of learning that might just vary a little bit from the way we teach and learn today? Well, yeah. Well, premortally, we all have a Yerman summum. So, so later on, as we go into the millennium, um, those that need it will have at least one or two Yerman summums. They will also have um, different tools and gifts that we had premortally that will be utilized again as the veil is lifted and released. And um, I don't, I don't want to go into that too much because it's a bit too much for people to handle. But if you look in the scriptures at the, at the gifts that the prophets use, everything from seer stones to Urim and Thummim to sepulchers and Leohonas and things like that, those are all things of an eternal nature that as we go into the millennium will, will be given to those who are ready to use them. And some people will have moved past the need to use a Urim and Thummim but they might use that for other purposes. Also, when you're talking about portals and things like that, transportation, there are so many amazing technologies that we do not yet have on the earth that, that will be brought back to us. That's so exciting. Thanks for sharing that, Julie. Yeah, it's really cool. That's a good question. Um, well, I think it's about time that we wrap this up. I just wanted to thank you both, Emma and, and Eric, for your questions today. Emma, thank you for this, this awesome topic. I hope it's been a help to those who are listening. You did great. Um, do you have any more questions? We can take one more question if you need to. Okay, one more question. What about people with medical needs, in particular mental question. illness? That's a good question. Well, having severe medical issues myself and dealing with mental illness um, and having loved ones that I know and a fork twist that deal with this, um, I think we should do an entire podcast just on that, okay? So let's let's table that for now. Eric and I will do a podcast on the effects of mental illness, on the effects of medical problems like diabetes or autoimmune or Lyme or other things like that. And I'd like to just have people stay tuned for that. We'll do we'll do at least one, if not several, podcasts related to what we do with medical issues when we go into the tribulations. Right after the one on translation, right? <laughs> I can't promise which one's coming first, but yeah, right. I know I've got a whole lineup of what we can do, and if I forget to do these, people will remind me because I get emails and they 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 never let me get by. So <laughs> all right, <Anyway. laughs> that sounds great. Emma, I Thank love you so much, Julie. Thank you. All right, um, we'll talk soon. Hey, Julie, I have a final thought if I can. Um, great. As I think about you know young people moving forward and and even old people into the millennium, I have this. Great scripture from Doctrine and Covenants 45, verse 58. And it says, And the earth shall be given unto them for an inheritance, and they shall multiply and wax strong, and their children shall grow up without sin unto salvation. And it just sounds like a wonderful time to be alive. That is a wonderful time. And that makes me think about those that inherit the earth, those that go into millennium that are on the earth right now, will be called some of the ancient ones. And I think that's very telling that they will one day, for some of you, talk about those that are in this generation, what great valiant spirits you are, and they will glean for your understanding and your knowledge as you're educated, and you tell them what it was like to live through the tribulations, what it was like to live pre-millennia, and I think that's pretty cool. Thank you so much, Eric. You bet. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Emma. All right. Appreciate you guys. Bye.